Well, Eric, if you have something to say, you should you should say it. Uh, I mean, you've seen the, you you've written in so many panels, and you've seen so much this weekend. Maybe you can set up the conversation. Well, one thing I wanted to try really quickly before we get going too much. What if everybody turned their video on, like the attendees? I want to see what happens in teams if the attendees all turn their videos on. <laughs> Let's keep going. Keep going. I want to see how many we, people we can get in here. Gotta be kidding me. I think we maxed out, are we? Nine by nine. Keep going. Keep going. I want to see you all. I think it's a limitation to nine. I'm doing something. Oh, okay. Meredith. <laughs> all right. Everybody turn theirs on. And then... Uh, I also want to try, uh, can you turn your audio on? Uh, attendees, can you turn your audio on? It's a lot of people I haven't seen all week. Hello, everybody. <laughs> all right, so one thing that I want to do is give a huge thanks to the people behind the scenes that made all this happen. Number one, Rachel Lim, really quick. amazing and she has been like organizing and sending you all emails and putting up the files and doing all the recordings so thanks to we have also had help from one person from microsoft umair who's helped like throughout getting every people on board and walking through thanks umair uh we have a team an adoption team that has a whole bunch of students Alan, Alex, Amal, Ksenia, Harrison, and more people that are part of like building all these tools for you guys and putting everything on the website for you. All right, um, so you can all go away now. You can put your uh, microphone <laughs> off and your video off. I really appreciate that. Um, sorry, Ksenia, one, one more for Ksenia. <laughs> Oh, there's Rachel. She's showing you up. <laughs> there's an interesting algorithm where Microsoft Teams decides who gets displayed in, in, in interesting and mysterious ways. Um, I guess what I want to say about really quick to, to kick this off on my part was um, this uh, this panel is, is sort of the vision of like what are some big national efforts in the space of data data science education, and um, I wanted to add to that uh, in a humble way and say that this workshop itself is one of the big networks in data science education, and this network is based on all of you people lean, leaning in and coming and participating and your questions in the chat and your feedback to the people creating the materials and it's really awesome to get so much great uh interest and enthusiasm in this space so uh i wanted to say that like i feel like this workshop having run it for the third time now this is one of the places where people who want to lean into data science education are meeting. And this is where the conversations are happening. And I would really love to ask for, uh, you know, your support to keep this going. Uh, everybody that could join the Slack for National Data Science Education. Um, everybody who could potentially share materials going forward of the different ways you're remixing things. We could potentially make a way for different people to share what their syllabus is, what their certificates look like. People are really interested in knowing this is such a new space and everybody's building a new certificate and a new course. And it's really helpful to see like what other people are doing. We don't have a great place where these things are uh, stored. And I guess I just want to go back to the beginning of the workshop. Um, you know, in, in the institutional transformation panel with some of the leaders like Nick Horton and Rebecca Nugent, uh, where, you know, we have things from like the American Statistical Association and the, a, you know, the ACM that are saying like, what's the roadmap for data science? But uh, on the other hand, like, I feel like in this meeting, we have like something coming up from the bottom. That's like, what are all the different ways that people are putting the Legos together to build things 
themselves? And what are they doing with the resources they have to create the courses they can create? And so I think there's something really great about like collecting our materials and sharing them. Certainly like the, you know, the reason that we started on this project was that Berkeley had done a lot of open source things that we were ready to share with people. But the open source isn't just about Berkeley. The open source is about keeping that going with keeping the materials that you create open source as well and like contributing them back into this data science education project. So I want to encourage people um, to keep participating throughout the year and keep um, sharing their materials back into the project uh, and keep um, the conversations going. There's a lot of what happens in the chat of this workshop of people answering each other's questions, people know, having little bits of information and crowdsourcing uh, the answers. And I would love to keep that going throughout the year in terms of a community um, uh, to crowdsource other, each other's answers and help each other answer institutional challenges, infrastructural challenges, curricular challenges, auto grading challenges. Like together we can keep this community going and we can really help each other a lot. Um, with that, I will want to turn it over to Anthony to moderate the panel today. All right. Thanks, Eric, for the inspiring vision going forward. Uh, definitely, you'll be get a chance again to talk about this at the end of the panel, too. Um, so maybe I will do a quick intro and just uh, describe the kind of the nature of this uh, last panel of the National Workshop on Data Science. Uh, we have uh, three great guests, uh, attendees from around uh, the U.S. and Canada that will be describing efforts uh, on to really support dissemination of curriculum and infrastructure for data science education. First, we have Anna from IBM, uh, then Mike Norman for, for who's uh, UCSD, SDSD, and also the Westpac Data Innovation Hub, and Jim Nicoleander from UBC, but also on initiatives such as the uh, uh, Syzygy and uh, Callisto that are really, uh, really exciting models for that we can learn in the US, along with this new initiative 2i2c. So I'm really looking forward to these presentations from all of our guests. Um, so uh, I think, can we start with Anna? Would you have, like to start the presentation? Wonderful. Give me one sec. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Echeverry, and I work with IBM. Uh, I am originally Colombian, so if you're wondering about uh, where this accent is from, uh, you don't have to wonder anymore. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and talk to you about OpenDS for All. Um, so what is OpenDS for All? So a um, couple of years ago at IBM, as we were working with our clients and uh, they were pretty much, most of them, if not all of them telling us, they were really struggling with the skills shortage in data science. Um, I started thinking that there was an opportunity to make an investment on a curriculum or a curriculum kit that we could make available to the world not to say this is it, you, you know, you just go do this, but really to accelerate the process of creating a data science programs around the world, especially outside of the US. Um, I met with several people from universities around the world and, and sometimes they would tell me, you know, our, our university really wants to build a data science program, but we don't even know what that means. So, so you know, when we start thinking about what it takes to build a full curriculum from scratch, it's very um, expensive, it's very resource intensive. So, so we decided that there was an opportunity for IBM to be a contributor um, and help accelerate these programs. So this chart that I have here is from last year, so it's not fully up to date. But this is sort of the growth of the data science and analytics programs in the US um, in the last few years. Uh, as we can see, the growth has been tremendous. But the reality is that when you compare the number of people that are coming out, you know, initially it was all just master level programs. And uh, more recently, there's been a lot more uh, announcements uh, of uh, bachelor programs in data science. 
but but when you think about the the vast need of the skills in the market there's really a mismatch so so no matter you know independently of like how much uh, the growth or has how significant this growth has been the reality is that this is still sort of a drop in the ocean in terms of the skills needed so so we really believe there's a tremendous opportunity to help uh, institutions that may not necessarily have all the resources uh, to build these programs from scratch. So, so that's that was sort of the origin of this idea. So we saw also that there were a lot of different, let's call them stakeholders, um, really trying to think about this, this, you know, this opportunity uh, from K through 12, community colleges, universities, also uh, services organizations corporate training, which is something that's really interesting because um, so I've been in this industry for about 30 years and um, and, you know, let's say 20, 25 years ago, um, it was very common for organizations to have very solid corporate training um, organizations. But then, you know, with all the cost cutting efforts and, and changes and, and economic impact, those had tended to disappear. Uh, now, more recently, and I think a lot of it um, has been driven by the growth of data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, we see more and more organizations uh, trying to work on, on building their own uh, education programs inside their corporations. So we felt like uh, there's all these organizations trying to build content maybe we can help them out in, you know, and then on top of this, we have all the digital offerings that exist out there uh, throughout all the different MOOCs. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so when we started thinking about this, uh, we made some decisions that I, that I think were very important. So um, the first one was we needed, we wanted to build this, uh, just using open source. So I know a lot of people think when you when they see IBM, it's like, ah, oh, they're just going to come with some IBM centric effort or IBM technologies effort. So so let me just, you know, clarify that our decision uh, was this needs to be completely based in open source. And, and we made the decision to focus on Python, even though, you know, of course, Python is not the only open source um, language or or the, um, technology platform for data science. But what we see is that Python has become sort of the de facto standard for data science. So, so that was our first decision. This needs to be built um, using open source. The second decision was, well, it cannot be built by IBM. So ideally, we want this to be built by professors for professors. So we partnered with the University of Pennsylvania. We worked with their directors of their computer science department and data science department, worked with um, a team of PhD students, and they uh, built this curriculum kit uh, that we're making available to the world. So again, you know, that was another very important uh, decision point. The third point that I think makes this uh, really innovative is that it wasn't just about let's let's post, you know, some this curriculum on some IBM site for people to download. Um, we decided to launch this as an open source project. So what that means is uh, this lives on GitHub. We ha are also partnering with the Linux Foundation for governance of the project. And this way we ensure that other institutions around the world that let's say they're further um, advanced in their journey building data science programs, they can contribute, um, they can provide updates, you know, as, as, as libraries change, you know, we'll need to do to bring new things. So by launching this as an open source project, we, we we feel you know that would bring a lot of value because then now anyone can just go on github get these materials um use them as is make them their own make changes or build on top of them and um and and build their programs but also other um subject matter experts faculty can also contribute to the project to make it stronger 
Um, we went live with this project in March, right about the time when the world shut down. So um, we had a lot of plans to really start driving adoption heavily. But what we found was a world where every single university was trying to transition from live delivery to digital delivery. Um, so we put a pause on, on, on those uh, adoption efforts. But um, right now we are restarting that and we are in several conversations with universities that want to leverage this. Now, they don't need us. So this is an open source project. All Any organization that, that's interesting, all they need to do is go to GitHub. Um, but, you know, sometimes if people want to have conversations or want, let's say, additional advice or want to, you know, just talk about how to bring this into the programs, we're happy to have those conversations. Um, so what's in OpenDS for all? So we have about 15 different modules and every module consists of a PowerPoint with um, theoretical background about the topic. It has at least one Jupyter notebook and every single data set that it's used, it's an open data set um, available uh, to anyone. Uh, so as you can see, the modules kind of walk um, um, learners or, you know, or professors through sort of the overall process of working with data um, needed for a data science program. So from, from introduction to data preparation, data visualization to uh, building machine learning models, scaling, deploying, uh, using uh, Spark data. Um, there are several models on machine learning, supervised and supervised, um, and then artificial neural networks. And of course, um, last but not least, uh, a whole module on ethics, which is uh, very critical. Um, we, uh, because it's an open source project, so the project has a technical steering committee and you see the list of people that are leading this committee right now. So, so the role of um, this mostly professors um, from different universities in, in, in the US is to drive uh, the project to success. So we meet every couple of weeks, uh, we discuss ideas about how to uh, grow the project in terms of finding other contributors, how to grow the project from the adoption perspective. Um, so all the members of the technical steering committee are there uh, ensuring that there's proper guidance and that we're doing the right thing for the community of people that will be adopting or working with the project. Um, so when you go to GitHub, this is what you're going to see, uh, a, a description, then it's going to have some information about the models, the, sorry, the modules. We have a taxonomy that we defined based on the initial modules of the, of the project, um, which is the buckets that you see on this image. But this will be, um, as we get new modules contributed, this, you know, of course, will be adopted to meet the needs uh, of future content. Um, so with that, uh, what I would love um, to, um, to, to, you know, to ask you right now is uh, we really want to work with anyone that's involved in academia in data science programs. One from the, let's say, contributors perspective, if there's faculty on this call or people that, that feel like, well, I have some really cool content that I will be happy to contribute to the project, then you know we would love that. We're also looking for committers of people that are there to ensure the integrity of the curricula. And of course, uh, adopters, if you're familiar with organizations that are in need of uh, accelerating the creation of a data science program through access to a curriculum kit that they can take on and make their own. Um, so, you know, I would encourage every one of you to to work with us as we as we grow this project. You'll see my name here, um, Andre DeWall on my team. It's also uh, he's actually the chair of the technical steering committee and, and we're happy to have conversations 
um, for anyone that has a specific questions about uh, OpenDS for all. Um, there's the link to GitHub where you're going to find all the different modules and uh, and any um, you know community and, and information around the project. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. So uh, Anna, I think we'll be moving some of the questions. Uh, you can have a conversation in the chat room, but okay. also uh, but also we'll be leaving questions from the community at the very at the second half of the hour. Perfect. Uh, up next, so we have Mike, uh, Mike Norman from San Diego. Uh, Mike, would you like to start? Sure. Okay. This is my first time using this particular tool. Can everyone see this? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, it's a real pleasure to be addressing you this afternoon, and I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and David Culler for uh, tipping me off to this opportunity. I'd like to talk about Cloud Bank, which is a NSF-funded project, a fairly new project to deliver managed services to simplify cloud access for computer science research and education. Uh, there are three universities involved, UC San Diego, where I'm located, University of Washington, and uh, UC Berkeley. And there you can see the, uh, I am the PI of this effort, and uh, the co-PIs are listed there. So as soon as you start talking about cloud to somebody, um, their mind can go in any of a hundred different directions. And so uh, when I was describing this project to a CIO, he asked me, what problem are you trying to solve? And so I thought I would start with this slide just to, uh, you know, bound this project. So we have three primary stakeholders. We have the National Science Foundation who funds us. We have size researchers and educators, that is uh, researchers who are funded by the size directorate of the NSF. And then we have the cloud providers that we partner with. And so this is the top problems we're trying to solve. For the NSF, we are trying to create an entity that will facilitate the use of cloud for their uh, funded PIs. And uh, the NSF stipulates that these cloud resources must be IDC free. For size researchers and educators, and I would like to point out that uh, the NSF uh, in the solicitation, uh, put educators on first, uh, you know, class basis here. And of course, researchers are often educators and vice versa. So uh, it is really meant to serve both size, computer science research and education. So principally to remove the friction associated with cloud access and account management and to hide cloud contract negotiation. Secondly, to help educate them about cloud with appropriate documentation and then help them with the cloud resource request part of their NSF proposal. And for the cloud providers, uh, they're of course interested in new users and growing the market. Uh, but uh, to be perfectly uh, frank with you all, um, the, the, the cloud vendors would like the NSF to pay them and not the other way around, which is the way it's been going with uh, cloud vendors providing cloud credits to the NSF uh, to hand out. So they would like to get paid for the services they provide. Now you might say, well, what's the problem? Isn't it all perfect? And uh, the answer is no. Uh, here you see uh, 10 or so quotes that we got from CS researchers at UCSD, UC Berkeley, and University of Washington and I'm not going to read through these, but basically uh, there were a lot of pain points um, addressed here, and they tend to uh, bucket into two major categories, time and hassle. And so they find using the cloud either a hassle or too time consuming or both. So Cloud Bank will address these pain points through a set of managed services listed here, cloud solution consulting, training, proposal assistance, help with onboarding, account setup, user management, and offboarding, 
tools for PIs to manage uh, their group members' accounts and uh, grant permissions and keep them from spending each other's budget. Uh, we are uh, cloud agnostic in our approach, so we uh, use multi-cloud tools to unify reporting across the cloud providers. Um, we have um, a cloud reseller by the name of Strategic Blue that does the, fin the FinOps, if you will, for all of this, and they bundle multiple small requests into larger bulk requests which provides financial leverage to secure discounts. And these savings are passed on to researchers. So to, um, to show all of this in a diagram, uh, this is probably the most important slide. This is the workflow for uh, how Cloud Bank works. So we start with a researcher sitting in an institution and they it's just uh, me and John De Niro going back and forth. I'm glad for that. Um, so you have a researcher sitting in an institution um, and they submit a proposal to a cloud bank eligible solicitation. Uh, if that uh, proposal is awarded, the money for people and usual stuff travel goes back to the institution, but the money to buy the cloud resources uh, does not go to the institution, it goes to cloud bank. And uh, so that's the first tip off for why we call it cloud bank. It is really like a bank, a commercial bank that has um, funds on deposit to purchase cloud resources on behalf of the users. So cloud bank will provision uh, a master account for the PI who can then create a for their users. Uh, the researcher then performs their research in the cloud, and we are launching with the big three, Google, Amazon, and Azure. Um, these clouds report usage to Strategic Blue, our uh, financial partner. Uh, Strategic Blue, who is in a way the bank inside of Cloud Bank, pays the cloud providers on use, uh, and then um, Cloud Bank will authorize uh, payment streams to Strategic Blue from the award from the NSF. So uh, we're all looking at the usage. And at this point, let me make an important uh, point. Cloud Bank holds the funds and only distributes them on usage, which means that a PI could change cloud vendors at any time because their money is in the bank. Um, and this avoids lock-in, it provides flexibility uh, and exploration. Once uh, uh, work is being done in the clouds, Cloud Bank will facilitate education, outreach, and training. And the last talk is just, uh, uh, you know, mana from the, the heavens in this regard, because we don't want to create anything. We want to simply broker what others have created. Um, so Cloud Bank is initially focused on two specific size solicitations. Uh, this is what they're funding us to do, but more solicitations will, will come. So Smart and Connected Communities is, is closed. Cyber Physical Systems closed yesterday. And our program officer, uh, Deep Medi at the National Science Foundation tells us that the entire size core uh, program will uh, use Cloud Bank. So you just need to keep an eye on those NSF solicitations. So the PIs request cloud resources in a supplementary document, not in the formal budget. And the cloud funding does not pass through the home institution. That's how IDC can be avoided. The total of your formal budget request and your cloud request must not exceed the total allowable request for the solicitation. And as I've said multiple times, cloud resources are free of free of IDC. So the project itself is organized into three main efforts. A user portal, which does a lot of the streamlining and automation on account management, education and training and the financial services. 
So this is um, a fairly large team. There's a lot of contributed effort uh, that is not charging to the grant at all. You see there's a big team at UCSD uh, split between the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which I direct, and our IT organization, uh, which, which Vince Kellen, our CIO, directs. Uh, University of Washington, Ed Lazowska is the co-PI there, and you can see some perhaps familiar names there. At UC Berkeley, David Cullors, co-PI, and James Percy has recently joined the project. Uh, Strategic Blue has a number of folks involved, and we have built an external advisory committee chaired by Dana Brunson, who some of you may know. She is currently at the Internet, too. Um, and they are to uh, keep us um, pointed in the right direction. As I said, we're launching with Amazon, Google, and Azure, but we are uh, busy populating uh, our, our portal with um, services from IBM. So that's actually quite far along. Uh, so uh, our previous speaker can rest easy. IBM is, is part of this. So in the first year of this project, and we're nearing the end of the first year, uh, the bulk of our effort was really building this portal, uh, which is really quite wonderful. Um, we're leveraging all kinds of software. Uh, Drupal is the foundation. CI login allows essentially to go from your campus credentials to uh, a cloud provider console in two clicks. Um, Nutanix Beam is a multi-cloud multi uh, cost monitoring tool that's used in the commercial sector. Very sophisticated tool, which will allow us to uh, monitor usage and send alerts to users as they deplete their funds. So the <clears throat> Cloud Bank portal uh, provides project developed and provider content to assist researchers. So there's a very uh, cool thing called the Cloud Resource Catalog, which lines up um, the four clouds. Uh, so IBM kind of joined the party a little late, uh, but looks like they're going to get there. Um, so there's a very nice uh, catalog that you can click down to your heart's content to find out what all the tool offerings are. There's information on how to use the portal, uh, video tutorials on cloud basics, uh, and then uh, a place where the cloud providers and, and third parties can have their tools exposed. So for example, Berkeley's uh, Data8 stack is uh, present uh, as a tool on this site. In terms of user support, it, it will be a three-tier model. Uh, tier one is basic help using the portal and working with accounts and billing. Uh, that'll be done out of UCSD. Uh, tier two is proposal support, uh, and that's getting started with the research and, and classes, and that is being led out of University of Washington and, and Berkeley. And then uh, tier three is a handoff to uh, the cloud providers themselves, uh, where we've negotiated, um, you know, some some basic support uh, for what's called break fix and other kinds of deeper engagements. Um, it's a five year project and we are nearing the end of the first year, which is the con construction phase. Um, and in years two to five, which starts in August, we will be in production. Uh, we have uh, basically finished with the portal and um, we've populated it with educational materials and um, it, it, it's, it, it, we're going to put up a, a demo of the portal on the Cloud Bank site very shortly and uh, it's really kind of a wonderful thing. You, you can get from your desktop to any cloud console in basically two clicks. Um, uh, this, I think, is my last slide. Uh, we also committed to the NSF to create a 
what we call a cloud bank center of excellence, which is really a community driven organization where uh, best practices will be shared. Uh, cloud source, cloud sourcing, not crowdsourcing, not cloud sourcing, crowdsourcing uh, knowledge and expertise. And, and uh, of course, this this conference uh, that I'm speaking in is uh, perhaps uh, one of the pre premier things to leverage in that regard, uh, which is why I'm I'm so pleased to be speaking today. But there are many organizations, uh, national conferences. Um, that we will try to leverage, uh, as well as the cloud providers themselves offer a variety of uh, training and hackathon events. So we're going to be putting that in place in year two uh, and hope to grow this into uh, a major resource for the computer science community. So for more information, you can go, go to our website, cloudbank.org. And uh, we've got a couple of FAQs up there. Uh, and if you would like uh, to get um, more deeply involved, you can simply email me or um, uh, submit an a email through our info at cloudbank.org. And we will be happy to partner with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Wonderful presentation. Uh, up next, we have Jim Coleander. Jim, are you okay to present? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. And can you see my slides? Uh, yes, I think they're they're just loaded. I see a lot of slides. Okay, great. And I just went full screen. I want to confirm you can still see. Yep. OK, great. So uh, I'm very grateful to uh, the organizers of this workshop for including me on this panel and for the opportunity to present. Um, I am James Coleander, and these slides are available. So if you want to copy that, if someone can copy that link into the chat, then others can see the slides. Uh, the slides include hyperlinks throughout. Uh, and so there are opportunities for others, if you so choose, uh, to follow up in more detail. So I serve as the director of the, okay, I just uh, seem to have lost screen sharing, so I'm going to go back. Uh, okay. I, don't, I think you're seeing my messy desktop rather than. Oh. OK, I'm trying here. So, no worries. Um, OK, I hope that you're seeing my slides now. Uh, I'll stay yes, out we can. Full yes. screen because I think something happened there. So great. No worries. Thank you. I serve as the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, and I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia. So PIMS, the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, is a distributed research institute that serves 10 universities across four provinces and the uh, state of Washington. As a distributed institute, we run various programs that intertwine researchers as far east as the University of Manitoba and as far west as the University of Victoria. And these distributed um, research programs require different kinds of ways of bringing people together. Uh, and this background provides some context for what I'll tell you about in just a moment. Uh, so PIMS, I want to acknowledge, is supported by the National Science and Engineering Research Council in Canada. Um, some inspirations for the national scale project that I will soon tell you about. So this remarkable platform that allows for the distribution of code and interactions with data, uh, I find very inspirational. Uh, and back when I was just starting into this role, I found this blog post by Jessica Hamrick, uh, who at that time was a, a PhD student at UC Berkeley, um, who described how to deploy Jupyter Hub 
um, for a class application. And I found this very inspirational. And I have the sense that Jessica's early work in this direction uh, kind of preceded a lot of the remarkable work that we're celebrating this week around Data 8 and Data 100. And I was very fortunate to see this post in the early days. Uh, the work that built on top of that, this outstanding class Data 8, I also find extremely inspirational. Uh, this big data geoscience community called Pangeo uh, I think is showing the future. Uh, there's going to be a different way that we as scientists and as instructors and as humanists and as social science researchers interact with each other, with the students that we train and with the data sources that we interact with. And it's my belief that Pangeo is a precursor to many changes across a variety of disciplines in that the cloud provides a kind of background or a, a, a platform on which communities can interact for training and for big data focused research. I'm very inspired by Pangeo. And I also served as the founder of an education technology company called Crowdmark that allowed me to understand the power and capacity of the cloud to deliver services to a wide variety of users. And with this background, I was very excited to start working with my colleague Ian Allison at the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences. Uh, he uh, has many of the magical skills that uh, underpin the Data 8 program and shares a lot of the kind of same skill set that UV Panda uh, ha has brought to the Jupiter community. And so with Ian uh, and our partners at Compute Canada and partners at Cybera, we did something I think pretty cool. This was the idea. Can we launch Jupiter Hub service for every student, every faculty member, every staff person at all the colleges and universities in Canada? And so we took a stab at that. And we now operate Syzygy, which has a certain catastrophic character in its success. So Syzygy provides Jupiter Hub service of the flavor that Data8 uh, uh, uses to uh, 25 universities and a user base just under 30,000 uh, users. Um, I said that the success is catastrophic in the sense that all of these universities are receiving this Jupyter Hub service, but without a service level agreement, without guaranteed uptimes, without proper liability controls, because it's all being delivered by a small mathematical sciences institute headquartered at UBC without all of that backing. Uh, along the way, we also uh, here's a here's a, um, a a panel that shows some of the uh, usage patterns. The different colors represent different universities. And when I took this picture, we had 136 current users. Uh, that number 25381 was the number of users at that time. We're we're above 27,000 today, um, but it just gives you a sense of kind of what the uh, the usage patterns look like. Uh, I was very inspired by this article that our, our, our host Anthony and collaborators at Berkeley wrote, which highlighted the work of PIMS and Syzygy and uh, highlighted an aspect of this that was not our initial motivation, but I think it is a corollary or an outcome. So by making the resource available through single sign-on at multiple universities, uh, in some sense, we make this infrastructure available in an equitable and inclusive way and we're supporting the development of data science and scientific computing and digital humanities activities across a variety of universities. Not all of those universities have the same capacity that we have at UBC or that we, we see showcased this week at Berkeley to turn on this type of infrastructure. Um, we also built on this success and launched a K-12 focus collaboration with our partners at Cybera called Callisto. So Callisto develops uh, resources leveraging cloud hosted interactive platforms like Jupyter with a target audience of students in grades 5 to 12 uh, and their teachers. And uh, this has been a rather successful project so far in that we've reached a lot of students and a lot of teachers. So here's a bit somewhat of a busy slide, but it maybe shows a little bit of the development. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but Jessica's Hamrick, Hamrick's post uh, back in 2015 conversations with Compute Canada, an agreement with Compute Canada for hosting, an announcement of the Jupyter Hub service, 
And then over time, we've expanded now to more than 27,000 users. And then later in the game, we launched Callisto. We secured $1.5 million twice from the government of Canada to support this project. And now we've reached uh, just under 2,000 teachers and more than 50,000 students uh, with this project. Through this uh, activity, we've also engaged with a lot of research teams, and I think this is part of the pattern that is represented in this workshop. So after you make a Data 8-like hub available a year or maybe six months later, someone wants to do something that involves deeper computing, more big data, something like that. And so we've seen an inspiration from this initial delivery of Vanilla Jupyter Hub, where people want more for different kinds of reasons. Uh, and there are many examples of these kind of deeper compute needs that uh, that I could go through. And all of those blue uh, lines there are texts, uh, are, are hyperlinks that you can follow if you wish. Some interesting lessons were learned through these two projects. There is a massive transformation in research and education taking place. This workshop is, I think, a, another example of that. If we imagine what the future looks like three to five to ten years from now, we might imagine that paper and PDF based journal articles will be replaced by executable article formats of the flavor that Chris Holdgraf spoke about previously. We've also seen that an ambitious strategy that takes advantage of open source and cloud uh, infrastructure can meet the demand. And we've seen that this strategy with single sign on uh, can advance equity and inclusivity. But we've also seen that the approach that we've taken is unsustainable and we need a sustainable business model as soon as possible. I think there are significant risks if we allow the commercial cloud or other monopoly providers to play the role that Elsevier played in Web 1.0 around publishing. I think it's crucial that universities and research communities stand with great control and hold the collaboration stack and the big data stack in their hands for development and for improvement, and then work in partnership with commercial cloud providers and, and other vendors to make sure that this is sustainable, open source to the extent that it can possibly be, and also transparent and aligned with the university research education service mission. So towards that goal, and in collaboration with folks from Pangeo, folks from MyBinder, folks from Berkeley, uh, and, and other sources, we are uh, soon to launch a nonprofit that we call 2i2c, and the name is meant to evoke the longer version of the name, International Interactive Computing Collaboration, with the goal to provide uh, interactive workflows such as JupyterHub and Jupyter and RStudio on top of JupyterHub that support research and education by providing the appropriate services and support and open tools necessary um, to support all of these kinds of collaborative and interactive workflows. Our mission is to provide this as a service for education with extremely transparent pricing, a perfect service level agreement that CIOs will easily sign, and also to make the expertise that can deliver this kind of service accessible for research projects and to collaborate uh, on research community uh, activities to embed engineers to make projects more successful. And any kind of excess revenue that comes from these two interactions we aim to reinvest back in the open source communities and support their interactions with the research communities that use these tool chains um, to advance our understanding and improve the knowledge of, of everything. Uh, I invite all of you to click that link or to go to 2i2c.org. And if you're interested in collaborating with us or maybe finding ways where we might be able to deliver Jupyter Hub service for data eight like programs at your colleges or universities, just fill in the contact form and we'll reach out to you and uh, find a way to bring you along uh, along this journey. Um, finally, there are some links to previous presentations with more details that you might uh, wish to review. There's also a link there to Callisto. And then finally, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of this remarkable workshop and for including me and the 2i2c team into this conversation. All right, thank you, Jim. Wonderful presentation. Um, Eric, would you like to, uh, I know you don't have a presentation ready, Eric, but uh, you have a lot to say probably about all of our collaborations with our various uh, uh, partnership with Berkeley has 
had uh, kind of been involved with all these uh, initiatives in a way. And uh, so, Eric, do you want to say a, a bit about it? And the, this is the third workshop also, the uh, third national workshop on data science education. And how do you want to encapsulate uh, Berkeley's efforts in relation to our these other uh, great speakers? I made a slide deck by uh, pirating uh, from the adoption team. Great. Give me a second. Can you see my slide deck? Not yet. Uh, Maybe I'll take a second. Is it coming? Um, not yet, at least for me. Does it look like it's coming? <laughs> not yet. Do you want to click on and off again on the uh, the share yeah. function? Yeah. Oh, let me find my teams. Oh, everybody practice their talk except me. <laughs> <laughs> Does the previous speaker need to stop sharing? I think he has. Yeah. I believe I stopped. Yeah. But if I had Eric's slides, I could share them again. OK. Thanks, everybody. What I wanted to do for this talk was I basically took the talk that's in the adoption talk and just adapted it to talk about us as a community um, and talk about the mission of our team that helps uh, working with undergraduate institutions across the country adopting data science. Um, The idea is like we have a full stack of open resources. Uh, we want to help other institutions use that stack, and we want to democratize uh, education in, in, for undergraduates in this space. So we have uh, the Data 8 materials, but we also have the Data 100 materials. We have a lot of materials that we haven't gotten into that much in this talk in this week as well on modules and connectors. We have a whole bunch of materials that are out in the domains that are using the data science tools. And finally, the human context and ethics uh, component has really come along a long way in the last year to build more and more open resources as well. Obviously, today we've just had these great talks about Jupyter Hub and grading where there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work uh, and putting it out there for all the institutions to use. So we have tried to measure our impact. Uh, this is a, a recent count that 34 different institutions have adopted pedagogy from UC Berkeley, and there's 30 plus more uh, currently developing to teach classes either in the fall or in the spring of the coming year. Uh, we have over 200, 220 professors in the community of practice. We would like to keep that growing. We're hoping after this week, there'll be more people as part of our community of practice. We do a lot of outreach. Uh, a lot of people email us. Uh, a lot of people, uh, we reach out to a lot of people at a lot of different um, institutions. This year, we've been reaching out a lot to the community colleges. Uh, we've you know, obviously been working with a lot of four-year universities. Now there's a lot of interest at high schools. We have a few high schools contacting us, and we're starting to think about how we can reach out to high schools in our area. And we've also been working with uh, big, you know, the big research hub, West Big Data Hub, um, which have their own networks in this area. We carry out a lot of Zoom calls with professors, uh, the students, you know, do a lot of outreach, like how can we help you? What materials can we help you with? Um, constantly sort of like trying to explain what the materials that we have are. There's a lot of behind the scenes to this level of growth. Uh, and we had a panel last night that was really promising, a new effort on California community colleges. Uh, we did outreach to all the community colleges in California. We have a few that we're really excited about for adopting in the current year. Um, and we're looking forward to how we can support them going forward. 
just to keep in touch, we've been writing up a lot of these. So a lot of the great uh, calls with good adopters have been written up into sort of articles about their adventure or, or you know, their adventures and their choices. Um, so there's a, a Substack page where um, these write-ups go and they're, they can be really useful resources for other people looking to adopt to hear what other people's choices were. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been updating a bunch of different resources. So there's a newsletter um, that, that sort of like summarizes a lot of the different efforts that are going on for this team over time. One thing I really want to push is our Slack. I would love it if everybody uh, signed up for our Slack channel as a way to keep it going. Um, there's over 200 professors on there now, uh, a lot of possibilities of answering each other's questions, um, and a lot of uh, places where we will be sharing updates on our resources and other people can share what resources they have as well. Finally, we've done a lot of, uh, of sort of trying to upgrade our outward facing resources. Um, uh, data.berkeley.edu slash external. Um, we've done new materials on the on the data eight course staff. This is all based on like our questions from our Zoom calls. We get different, uh, you know, in, inputs from uh, people looking to adopt data eight and we put together materials when we get a lot of questions. Um, we put, a, put together a fact based on a lot of the questions we get similarly. We've been working on the repo. We are hopefully putting together a private repo for people who need access to the grading. Um, there's the academic resource kit, which is the thing that we have like the one page handout. This is helpful if you need to explain what you wanna do to the next person or the next person. Um, it's sort of like trying to fit the, the bundle of things that we're promoting and, 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 and giving out uh, as open resources. Um, there's a couple new things on here. One is like comparing uh, a bunch of the different private offerings for people trying to navigate between private offerings. And then there's another one that's sort of comparing the different scales of uh, Jupyter Hub and new Jupyter Notebook deployments just to give people a way to think through their choices. Finally, there's two big Jupyter books. If you're in the last talk, uh, there was a, it was about Jupyter books. So there's two Jupyter books that contain a lot of what an instructor would need to know. One is about the technical infrastructure, like how to set up your Jupyter Hub to be like what Berkeley has. And it's like sort of a walkthrough guide on how you would want to do that and uh, how, how you need to set things up behind the scenes if you need to work with your IT department. Um, and then the other one is sort of setting up the technology stack, stack for teaching, how to set up data eight specifically, where to get um, you know, the labs and homeworks and um, setting them up in a workflow for getting them out to students and receiving them back in. We have an internal database that has a list of all of our contacts, how many, um, you know, people have adopted, have we reached out to, have we talked to? Uh, this is uh, something that's been built over the last year. Um, and this is a resource internally for us. There is an external page that uh, the student worked last night to build up of the different universities that have adopted uh, Data8. So we can now sort of have a, a real time updating of who's working with the materials. Uh, so that's an exciting, uh, new thing that we will be putting on the web page soon. We have an awesome team again. Thanks so much to the team. Uh, there's so many great students working on this. Uh, the students really lean in with their um, uh, with their expertise in different ways. So uh, I just wanted to put this up there for like, there is this great email that lots of different people write us for, for lots of different reasons. And the students can uh, answer everyday questions or we can schedule calls or we can put you on our emailing list. Finally, as it's the end of the conference, we would like to get you to fill out our feedback form. Uh, Rachel will send this uh, in the email as well. 
but uh, it's helpful for us as this is our third year running it, and we hope to keep it going in some mutated new effort going forward. So please uh, give us some feedback on what was interesting and useful to you about this workshop. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Eric. Uh, now I think we can have time for uh, questions. Um, if you have questions, please you know push it onto the chat box we have. Uh, I don't see questions particularly unless someone else can see it. But um, I, maybe I'll just start off by saying that you know all the presentations have been wonderful, and maybe just to think about what's have going to happen in the next few years actually, because a lot of, there will be a lot of exciting things that are just starting this year and will be uh, continuing on. But like, uh, I, I guess what I want to hear from people is like, what is the given everybody's energy and all these exciting initiatives, what what are the biggest roadblocks going forwards? From just you know making data, this new revolution data science really successful, um, you know there, I have some guesses, but I want to hear from individually from all these members here. What are the roadblocks as we keep on building this movement? You're are you asking the panelists or the uh, attendees? No, the panelists. Sorry, yes. No. Oh. I'll go first. Um, so I, I think that uh, what I perceive to be a significant roadblock is kind of captured by the remarkable presentation by Catherine Carson earlier this week. The roadblocks associated with kind of who owns data science, is it stats or is it math or is it computer science? What's the role of digital humanities or economics in this conversation? Um, making sure that the computer scientist that knows all about Kubernetes or Dask isn't down talking to the poet that wants to understand, you know, the, the natural language processing of a certain collection of poems. There's a kind of cultural obstacle, I think, that we have to overcome to make the full scope of what might happen actually take place. That's great. Anna and Mike? Eric, do you guys have thoughts? Um, yeah, I'll weigh in on this. Um, I am a computational scientist, and that discipline was uh, where this one is about 30 years ago uh, when computational science programs were springing up at, all across the United States and Canada. And if you ask, did they find a final solution on how to implement that? The answer mm -hmm. is no. It's like uh, they say, you know, uh, politics is local. And so I think there is no simple answer to that. I think it it will get implemented in various ways, some successfully and some unsuccessfully. Um, now at UCSD, um, we have a new institute for data science with an unpronounceable first name, the Halagiolo Data Science Institute. I actually house it in the San Diego Supercomputer Center, but it was invented to be cross campus uh, and interdisciplinary from the get go. And so I think um, I'm hoping that that experiment will be successful, but I do appreciate the difficulty of getting people out of their foxholes and listening to one another. So my. <clears throat> My my point of view is a little different because I'm from industry, not not from academia. And um, it, so what I what we experience a lot. So you know, from the academia perspective, is when we meet with universities, is the fact that they're trying to build so many different things. So it's it, it's a bachelor of science. It's uh, on data science, but there's also the bachelor of science in artificial intelligence, and in the masters, or should we do certificates, or should we do some sort of you know uh, summer courses so so we see a lot of struggle around trying to do too many things but but the from the industry perspective one big challenge that i see is that from the ibm perspective when i talk to clients they're dealing with this um, skill shortage but people that are already their employees cannot just like quit their jobs and go back to school, right? So, so you know, there is all this motion as well as leverage digital training, but as great as digital training is because it gives us all this scalability, 
it only gets you so far. So, so one of the things that I wonder uh, with my hat as someone from industry is, what are we doing from the academic perspective to address the needs of uh, the people that are not the re you know the young people that are going into universities? Let's say the people that are already in jobs and that are trying to figure it out how to get these skills without quitting their jobs. So I don't know if this you know this is a completely uh, uh, random. <laughs> answer but it's like it's it's one of the challenges that we see it's people saying i want to become a data scientist but i cannot just quit my job and you know go get a master's uh so i don't know if there's thinking around how to make it easier for people that are let's say mid-career to transition into these fields that involve more than just digital education okay. um Eric, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I guess um, two things that excite. So there's obstacles that excite me. Like, where's where's the work to be done? Where where do I want to put myself going forward? I guess one is this question of like, you know, community colleges and institutions with less resources, uh, HBCUs. We're going to work with, you know, and and I'm excited um, to sort of get these tools and this power and like this type of learning to into more and more people's hands and sort of like broaden the base um i think you know we operate i operate in berkeley where we have like really amazing students and really amazing resources but like the challenge is how how to broaden the base and get more and more people's hands on things um i also like uh jim will go with the disciplinary thing where like there's different people who are sort of getting uh, what this might mean for the future and how it might change education and learning. And um, so I definitely have a mission of like, try to get the economists to figure out why this is great and try and get the sociologists to figure out why their students could benefit from, you know, a big upgrade in the way they learn uh, their quantitative methods. Um, so I, I like that challenge of trying to, I, th I think the quality of what we're offering is great. And I think there's a great challenge to like, how do we get these things out there? Um, there's somebody's question in the chat that's like, how would you define data science? Uh, that's sort of an interesting, uh, se we segue in a way, um, you know, I have different ways that I define it to different people depend on, on the user. Um, you know, I guess. For me as a teacher, what I try to say is like it's a mixture of computation and, and statistics. And it's also just like a a, re, a revolution and a renewal in the way we um, teach statistics. So just as like a teacher in, in the university level, there's a lot of people that are learning statistics the way that I would have taken it maybe uh, 30 or 40 years ago when I was an undergrad. And, uh, you know, a lot of it's like renewing things for the current day. There's a lot of uh, the way we think about statistics and the way that com computational power has revolutionized statistics and our ability to like have the data tell us what's going on rather than writing a formula with a pencil and paper to ask the data what we think is going on. We actually had to go through the exercise of defining what data science was because um, IBM makes a lot of effort to have apprenticeship programs. So, you know, we go out and we hire uh, people that may not have a college degree and through education, uh, mentorship and real world work experience, we uh, turn them into, uh, as, you know, someone is specialized in a certain field. So I was the person that was tasked with building the data science apprenticeship program at IBM. And um, you, in order to do that, you have to work with the Department of Labor and you have to provide to them a very granular skills competency model. And then you have to submit a plan for how you're going to build those skills with their apprentices. Um, because at the end of the program, the Department of Labor actually issues a certificate saying you are, in fact, a junior data scientist. So we actually had to go through that exercise of 
defining and you know of course there's not one definition but we actually had to go through what what are the mathematical foundation sort of elements that we need to have what are the comp computational or programming elements that we need to have and then you know the statistics and then you know all the machine learning and how to build models and uh, validate your best model deploy your model so we had to go through that I put the link on 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 the chat because you know we published a white paper on on that work that we did of defining data science. So I, I want to speak to this question about uh, what is data science and kind of goes back. It, it has a nice tie back, I think, to the uh, the panelist Anna here. So in 1982, Richard Feynman gave a series of lectures uh, at T.J. Watson Research Center, I believe, um, about the physics of computation. And the beginning of his talk has this kind of polemic where he says there's no such thing as computer science. It's not a science, it's engineering. It's like playing around with computational devices and making them work faster. That's great, that's engineering. But he kind of violently almost objects to the notion of computer science. Now, I think we all kind of understand that there is a science of computation and that view that Feynman had has changed. So my perspective on data science is the explosion of the Internet of Things uh, and other forces have created new phenomena in nature. Uh, phenomena of studying climate through remote sensors, phenomena of studying social behavior through the Twitter pipeline. There's all of this phenomena that has to be understood with the methods of science. And I think we can all agree that science is a method to try to understand things where you criticize a statement and you attack a statement, you run experiments. And now we're doing that same sort of methodological approach to understanding the phenomena that's coming out of all of this data. Others in my sort of community of mathematical sciences would sometimes say this is just repackaging of statistics. But I don't think it is. I think that statistics is part of it but it is enlarged and there's now a kind of more experimental, interactive way to play with these data sources. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you have any comment? Or? Uh, like I said, I'm a computational scientist, but increasingly <laughs> the users of my supercomputer do, do data science with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I guess I have to have an opinion. Uh, I think of it as the inverse of computational science, where you start with, with a mathematical model, you apply uh, good algorithms, you run a simulation, and you get output data, which you then analyze for insight. Data science starts with data. It could come from a simulation, but mostly it's coming from the wild. And you, your goal is to create a model of that data for what? Insight. Mm -hmm. And so between those two ends, the raw material and the insight, there's just a lot of uh, math and statistics and, and computing involved, uh, which is why I'm involved in this. It's If the data is small, you don't need me. If the data is large, you need me. And if it's too large, I can't do it. It's got to be done in the cloud. So it, it's got a tremendous technological uh, middle middleware aspect to it, but in the end, it's getting insight out of some complex system, like like uh, the previous speaker said. It's it's about insight. Great, Eric. Are there other questions, or should I ask uh, kind of an open-ended question to the the panel? Go for it. Well, I'm just curious, given the diversity of the audience here, I mean, the, the, the panelists, uh, one covering kind of open source educational resources to uh, providing much needed cloud credits to institutions across the country, to uh, what Jim is suggesting about uh, 2i2c and kind of the, the interactive computing needs, uh, uh, like whether it's prov provisioning Jupyter hubs for uh, many institutions, uh, and even Berkeley's kind of one university model of how to tie some of these elements together. Um, how, how, do, how do we work together, I guess? I mean, I mean, some of us have been already in communication and uh, discussing potential kind of partnerships and uh, uh, sharing resources, but like, are there ideas coming out of this discussion and all the other panels that we've had over the last week about way, the way forward and uh, collaborating? Because it is 
it requires all of us to work together, I would say, to really uh, make data science uh, achieve its kind of potential out there. So just want to hear uh, just ideas and thoughts people have. On that note, I'm going to read what Catherine Carson wrote in the chat. The point of DS is the point of data science is to bring people together and provide them with adequate support methods and tools to make knowledge rather than to find to define a thing that people can claim. So I like that. That's great. Specific thoughts. So uh, yeah, I'll speak to Sparks. Uh, so. I'd like some of those cloud bank cloud resources to make 2i2c more uh, effective. I worry about the scope of cloud bank being CISE restricted because I want to deliver interactive computing to people in digital humanities, not necessarily people in that particular subgroup. Um, I'm also interested in trying to make sure that people that are working on NIH data should get access to the right slice of cloud to do their kind of work. I'm interested in trying to connect QIS kit and other forthcoming quantum computational uh, things once they actually start to go beyond what we can do digitally. So I think that IBM should be not just providing this, this kind of course, um, OpenDS for all, but also work to try to make sure their quantum advances are available to the community that's being assembled through these types of tools. And then maybe last, just to tie Eric into it, I want these courses like OpenDS for All and Data 8 and Data 100 to be easily accessed by people at universities that might be really small or colleges mm -hmm. that don't have the skills that that are available at places like Berkeley and UBC. So we need to find a really fast path to make sure that the infrastructure is easily made available in some sort of a sustainable way to the minority serving institutions, the historical black colleges and universities and so forth. Yeah, well, that is something that we have designed for. Uh, regarding your comment about size researchers, this is just where we're starting, and this is per the NSF's funding. But we've designed Cloud Bank to scale to infinitely um, because we we simply have to scale the automation of account management. And large commercial banks know how to do that. And we're effectively working with the commercial bank through Strategic Blue. So the part that doesn't scale is the handholding involved in doing the research. Uh, but, and that has to be addressed through community support, you know, through uh, crowdsourcing, uh, teaching one another through best practices and so forth. But with regard to the small institutions, um, if you want to create friction, the way to do that is to have every cloud provider negotiating a contract with every university. Mm -hmm. We bypass that explicitly in our design. Uh, so everyone who uses cloud bank is writing on UCSD's negotiated agreements uh, with, with the cloud providers. And that's how we can hide that completely from them. As soon as people start worrying about um, uh, liability with regard to what they're doing in the cloud. That's where the lawyers get involved and the institutions get involved and you create enormous friction. So we're, we're launching with a fairly frictionless solution that would allow a researcher at a minority serving institution uh, that does not have any cloud contracts negotiated mm -hmm. to win an NSF grant and get on the cloud uh, in a fairly frictionless way. We have a, a parallel effort called Cloud Bank Enterprise that it will explicitly deal with all of these more frictionful engagements that people would like. And we get asked all the time uh, by institutions. We have designed our portal to support an unlimited number of funders for an unlimited number of projects. But, you know, right now we're just starting with the money in hand. I think there's there's sort of different elements that would be really interesting to figure it out how to kind of, you know, quote unquote, unify to make it easier for smaller institutions to adopt them. 
one is curriculum, you know, as you said, you know, we've got Open DS for All and Data 8 and Data 100, you know, and, and I know with, with Eric, we've had conversations about how do we make this more, you know, more available to everyone. So that's one piece. The other piece is sort of the product access. And I think, uh, you know, we just saw some some great example of how to bring that together. But there's sort of also a third element that I that I don't, you know, I don't know how to how we can solve it and it's making people available so you know like i look at ibm there's tons of subject matter experts there's there's you know we have uh, uh, databases of volunteers that that are always asking how do i you know can i go do presentations can i go talk to a professor and help them get started but it's and i'm not talking about just us you know it's like how do we all kind of come together and build a pool of resources that would support a smaller organization. Because even with the curricula and even with the product, they may still need some hand holding uh, to get started. You know, this is not a simple, trivial field. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, but I think you know these conversations are a great starting point for how do we build this at scale? How do we make this more, you know, more scalable in a way that more people can benefit from? And I, you know, I don't know, open source may be an element, Slack groups may be another element, but I, but I think it's a, it's an interesting exercise to, to kind of break it apart into curriculum technology and people and see how we can make that uh, more available to others. And if we even if we want to think a step further, then it's jobs, right? So it's like, OK, and it, you know, once we figure this pieces, it's like, how do we help people, you know, come in from some of these smaller institutions, get access to to great job opportunities? Okay. Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, Oof. I don't know. There's a lot of different places that could go. I mean, I guess there is a whole weird thing of like, is there now an industry of data science? There appears to be a lot of jobs with six figures. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that they're actually for people who just graduate from UC Berkeley. There are a lot of them for people with PhDs. Um, uh, what I think though is like for students today, the tools that you would learn in a data science curriculum or a data science enhancement of a poetry class or a sociology class or a history class are great tools for whatever career you go into, whether it's called a data scientist or whether it's like historian or literature critique. I mean, so I think we're offering an awesome 21st century tool set for people who are studying today and um, they're going to be useful in 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 a wide range of careers and a wide range of potentials and like just in citizenship like just knowing how to understand data critically and the ethical implications of data and the data gathering process and how to make arguments with visualizations and dashboards like these are just 21st century skills for anybody to have um so i, I think that Upgrading the data science content across educational spectrum uh, is still an outcome that I want to fight for and be part of and not just like feeding people into what's like a career field data science. Mm -hmm. Great point. So definitely career development is maybe one of the fundamental goals of all the work here. But um, again, I'm not to try to be too controversial, but after hearing a lot of comments is like, all the work a lot of us are doing, in a sense, is not trying to benefit a place like UC Berkeley, perhaps, or even other R1 institutions. It's fundamentally a lot of the work we're trying to do, whether it's for career development needs to, uh, or providing infrastructure at a discount, uh, is really helping other institutions, the majority of institutions that, frankly, do not have a data science program. Um, what are people, uh, do people agree with that kind of assessment? I mean, because I think, you know, even in this COVID era, I would say, you know, Places, uh, large institutions that have the infrastructure, the money, uh, even the talent, uh, the, the developers or the, the instructors, I think they're going to be OK. But I, I do worry about so many other institutions that are still trying to play catch up and uh, they don't have the curriculum, they don't have the political buy in. 
<laughs> they don't have the cloud credits. They don't know how to contact someone at Microsoft or Google. Um, well, do people agree with that assessment? Because I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Berkeley needs more support on, from, uh, I mean, you know, it's not really designed for us per se, or it's like the Ivy League school. It's really trying to help the, all the community colleges that it was in an earlier panel last yesterday. Um, would, would people agree with that assessment? This is really about, in, in many ways, given the political climate, partially about inequality too. Like, the haves have it. The, most pe most institutions do not have this these resources. Would you would you would people agree with that? Well, I you know. Cloud Bank will be a failure if it doesn't serve the non R1 universities. Mm -hmm. um, and and so we looked at exactly what do you need to do in order to empower someone at such a university? And you basically have to set the table with everything they would need to begin an exploration, whether they are a researcher or uh, an educator. And I think you know, what Berkeley has done so beautifully is set the table beautifully and then made it portable, you know, through your distribution. So, but at some point, formal education has to take it the rest of the way. Uh, if, if I look at how computational science evolved uh, as a methodology of science, by and large, it just became embedded in the individual departments of, you know, of uh, disciplinary departments. It's just viewed as a methodology to do X. And I think data science will go the same route in the fullness of time. But that doesn't mean that you won't have a department of data science that is focusing on sort of the pure, the pure stuff itself. The methods, the algorithms, the principles. Mm -hmm. But I think the formal education has to, uh, the formal education will drive it into every corner of the academic landscape if it's done right. And I think doing it in, in the way that Berkeley has been doing it is, is a very powerful approach. Yeah, I think if we think about the world a few years down the road, I cannot imagine that, you know, like literally every single program should have some element of data science. Like imagine you're a marketing major. How can you be a marketing major without analyzing data from all the digital platforms, right? So, and I think if you start looking at every one of the uh, sort of specialties, even within humanities, there's a great opportunity to bring in uh, a data science element in there. The main maybe it doesn't need to go as deep in terms of full understanding of all the algorithms, but maybe there's a subset of that that can be made more uh, more massive, you know, more massive penetration into other programs. I mean, we had these conversations uh, looking at <clears throat> in a meeting trying to decide with the college board, um, whether should they create an AP data science test and should be should they create this track? And and a lot of the conversations were always like, well, how how deep do we want to go? Because the reality is we want all the students to have certain data science uh, understanding. But then, you know, if you want to track, then you just you, you need to have that track that goes really deeper and that requires more mathematical foundation or more, you know, technology, technology power. Uh, so I think there's that opportunity of, of, the, of the do this end uh, where we maybe take a subset of things that we incorporate into all programs, but still maintaining the deeper level of data science specific work. Yeah, I, I want to jump in on this. So I, I'm more terrified about this question than I think others on the panel have been so far. <laughs> so um, we take for granted email now, but if we look back, you know, uh, before email, collaboration wasn't so easy. And I think the pace of um, impact of these tools is creating far too many haves and have not separations. Mm -hmm. uh, and unless we figure out a way 
and you know berkeley's been very generous compliments hats off to berkeley they were ins inspirational to me and all that we did in canada and then we turned on single sign-on at some universities and that eliminated a barrier many people that we spoke to said oh it's no big deal i can just install anaconda we don't need that you know why why, why do we care about this cloud hosted thing it's easy right and for the second year students in a computer science department that's right but it doesn't create that sort of emancipatory opportunity by eliminating the smallest hurdles, things go faster. But to be an effective citizen that understands when or when not to wear a mask because of a pandemic or how to vote because of a visualization that's very JavaScripty on the New York Times webpage, like we need to raise all the citizens up with these kinds of skills. There are other issues that are more timely, like what are we going to do about predictive policing? It's happening. We at the R1s might think, oh, it's fine. We're managing this AI. But in fact, we might be baking in racism into police practices. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's incumbent upon us. It's a duty on us to figure out how to make sure that these skills are as broadly transmitted as quickly as possible for fear around democracy and around the have have not separation. One uh, thing that I've found is that there's a lot of fear, not so much of the technology, but fear of the math. And and I and I don't know if this, you know, if all of you share that that experience, but I've seen a lot of people that are like, I feel like I could even learn learn to code, but when you start telling me that I need some elements of linear algebra and that I need all this, you know, inferential statistics, which is like, you know, this panic button goes on. And I don't know if that's the case for others, but I that's been my experience. Because technology wise, you know, we could also go the road of just, you know, graphical tools, right? And there's no, no need to go. So my dogs. There's no need to code, but in the math, it's always there. I would agree with that, so We definitely see a lot of uh, students at many institutions, even at Berkeley, that uh, once, even though data can be very inviting, that the, uh, the, the math requirements afterwards can be a bit uh, challenging. And uh, certain, certain institutions have been developing math courses that have more computing in them, uh, linear algebra with, uh, with programming and data science. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there's still much to go, I feel like, and uh, uh, hopefully we can all work together to figure that out. Eric, do you have additional comments? No, I I mean, I'm happy to let the conversation run. I feel like it's kind of, um, we're kind of nearing the end. Um, I uh, First of all, I want to work with everybody on this panel. I want to keep uh, Mike Norman while you're on. Uh, we're going to keep working with James Percy, and we're hoping that we can uh, sort of figure out some sort of, uh, you know, window for the non R1 people to access the cloud bank, uh, you know, credit union, as it were. Um, maybe that's through, you know, an ad hoc thing, but maybe that's also like bundled into like a 2I2C or like a Berkeley for community colleges or something that's like, you know, cause it's also a burden for like each community college to line up for at the credit union window. Um, I guess like Anna, I would love to keep, you know, working with you and in, in terms of like, you know, we want to create creating community around GitHubs of awesome Jupyter notebooks for teaching. Um, and, you know, I want to make sure that the people that we assemble are sort of pretty much overlapping with the people that you assemble. You know, I want to not be like on different forked projects with different tribes, right? I want to make sure like our tribes know each other, <laughs> as it were. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and Jim Colliander, like, I'm excited to conspire. I will keep sending people to 2I2C. I hope we can launch something on a pilot this year and just, you know, my vision is like, let's, I don't know how we do it bootstrapping wise. I'm not an entrepreneur like you, but I kind of feel like it's time for us to launch something for some some of the people that came to this workshop and, and have that to, 
you know, raise money and put on our case studies and show people like we did it with these people who had these resources and here's a pathway forward. Um, so I definitely want to keep collaborating with everyone here. Sounds good. I look forward to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, be mindful of time and this is, is the last panel of the workshop. I, I wonder if people have any closing comments of, of the discussion uh, and also questions that you might have for each other. Uh, because there's a lot of things we can still talk about, but uh, uh, you know, do, you, do you, each of you have a, like a closing pitch or a message for the the public and all these instructors that are these on this pa uh, listening to this panel? Anna, do you want to go first, or any closing thoughts um, of the discussion and? kind of uh, what you want people to take away from the discussion? Well, from from my perspective, I'm, I'm just looking forward to continue collabor collaborating with all of you. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this Slack group that was created because I think that gives us an opportunity to connect, you know, with a lot of people that are sort of trying to solve this or address this opportunity. Um, from the open DS for all perspective, you know, I'll be happy to 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 talk to people that might be or might see uh, opportunities for smaller uh, institutions that are trying to implement or build their own programs. I'll be happy to work with that. Um, Eric, I know um, a lot of the data aid and what we have uh, complements really well. So so I think as we've discussed, you know, going in with that um ensuring that people know about data aid and that there's other layers that they can because i don't think there's there's such a thing as as one size fits all so i think having this opportunity of of availability of different modules that they can adopt to make their own it's it's exciting so um just just happy to be here and be a part of this community So I have a comment. Uh, I kind of look at 2008 as the era of open data. Every government made data available. And right now we're witnessing, I think, the complementary reaction of open tool chain. And the people that I imagine I'm speaking to are kind of training the next generation of people that are going to figure out how to use that tool chain to interact with that data in a variety of ways. And I guess my main message is be careful about the tools that you choose to build your programs on. Things that are free may have costs later. And some of those costs were, for example, what happened with publishing uh, in the Internet 1.0 era, where it just seemed so great. We could just send each other PDFs. We didn't have to print and send it to our libraries. And then the bundling kind of bit us later. And so I just encourage everyone, all the CIOs, all the CTOs, to think carefully about the values and the mission of your institutions, and then choose wisely how you're going to build curriculum and infrastructure to facilitate the transformation that you're all struggling with. Excellent. Mike, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, well, just a small thought. Um, if I could go forward in four years and look back at what Cloud Bank accomplished, uh, one question I would ask is, who, who were most of the users? Were they researchers or educators? And um, I don't have the answer to that right now. Um, we, we've kind of targeted uh, PIs who will get grants through these specified programs. But we also have discretionary funds, uh, and I have that discretion as PI, to uh, kick off some educational projects. And so uh, this is what uh, we hope to work with Berkeley about is, you know, if you can line them up, we can knock them down. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it, Mike. <laughs> Our budget isn't large enough to, you know, to do 100, but we could certainly do 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I hope that we can work together in uh, making, making that happen. Great. Awesome. Eric, uh, again, do you have any closing thoughts? I know you already give a, uh, a nice little uh, closing remark at the beginning, but uh, 
you know, we are almost, uh, it's been really, lo you know, fascinating five days of presentations, panels, and, you know, discussion. Uh, how would you like to wrap it up? Uh, just uh, thanks to everybody for leaning in. Thanks for your time. I know uh, lots of high power on this panel and on a lot of the panels. Uh, people are participating from different time zones. Uh, I really appreciate everybody leaning in, and I really feel like we've created a lot of high quality content through our discussions. Uh, stuff will be archived. Um, for us as an organization, um, just having this deadline as like a way to like upgrade our resources and put them up publicly. Um, so um, I, I hope that the visibility for everybody's projects has been helpful. Like more people know about Cloud Bank and 2i2c than, uh, <laughs> than a couple days ago. Um, so thanks everybody for participating and together we can you know, keep working on these goals that we've identified together. Absolutely. And uh, we'll be uh, look forward to seeing everybody again next year, 2021. Hopefully <laughs> some of us in person by the time it comes. So uh, again, I want to wrap up this panel a little early so people uh, can uh, enjoy the rest of their Fridays. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, an exciting, ex you know, very, you know, detailed, uh, rich panel that looks at the future of how do we work together on a national and international level. So uh, again, thanks everybody for being a part of this. Feel free to continue on the discussion or remain on the call if you'd like. But uh, you know, just want to conclude our the 2020 National Workshop on Data Science Education. And uh, I bid everybody to do. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Bye. Good job moderating. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank and you. the panelists, I don't know if you, there's been a, like a little bit of discussion in the chat. You might want to just put your eyes on. It's, uh, we didn't really touch on all of it, but I'm going to I'm going to drop off. But the chat's still there, so um, feel free to check it out. Will do. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. All right, bye.